So in um, section 11.2 of the Open Text Biology book, we're going to go into mechanisms of evolution. So we've already talked about some of these, but um, there's different things that kind of drive and make evolution happen. And those are um, natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow. And since we talked about those in the last section, we'll just go into a little bit more depth. So when conditions are bad in the environment, DNA doesn't just change itself um, to better suit the environment. In other words, a misconception or a belief is that evolution is trying to get somewhere or that your DNA, that every DNA molecule throughout your body can just suddenly flip to, to match a better circumstance. That's why the individual doesn't evolve. It's populations that change a little bit over time. Um, so natural selection will really pick off those that are not surviving as well as others. And that's in normal circumstances. Now humans actually, it's also hard for us to relate to this because in a lot of cases, especially in first world, world countries, um, a lot of natural selection doesn't affect us as much. Like if somebody gets sick, a lot of times um, in the United States, especially we go to great lengths to save that person, to remediate, to help. And so natural selection isn't happening as much in humans, but out in nature, it's happening a great deal. Um, and definitely I would say that it happens more um, with humans in third world countries where there's not as much funding to intervene um, on, on, you know, individuals who need extra help. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, mutation. Mutation is another mechanism for evolution. So remember that individuals don't evolve, it's populations that do. So if you, this is a picture that shows um, some genetic drift. I want to explain that again. Um, one example of genetic drift is polyploidy, which is an error in meiosis where the chromosomes move into one cell instead of separating. So as the cell is supposed to be dividing, all the DNA ends up on one side instead of the other. Now in most animals that would be lethal, but in plants it sometimes takes some time and it makes some plants that become able and capable of self-fertilization. This is a mutation. It, it doesn't happen much in animals. Another example of genetic drift is like this picture here, where originally there were just more brown bunnies and um, less white bunnies here. Um, and then in the next generation, just due to non, like just totally random mating, there were no like extra pressures. It's not like um, the white bunnies were being hunted more than the brown bunnies or anything like that just by chance in the next generation um, there's even less white bunnies and then in the next generation it's not seen at all anymore. This is a change um, in allele frequency in a population that changes from one generation to the next um, as a result of pure chance um, and has uh, you know, it's due to no advantages that one group had over another. So this is called genetic drift, where the genes just drift in another direction. So the next one that I want to talk to you about is um, a concept called the bottleneck effect. And the bottleneck effect is when a disaster hits a population, and this can be like a volcano, a hurricane, a severe drought, even um, man-made change, like we're just going to clear this whole field and put housing there. Well, like this is, I know there's like not as many dark orange marbles, but the light orange and green are about the same quantity. But even this um, dark orange marble has an equal chance of surviving or not as this one green one next to it, right? Um, now, as a whole, there's a lot more light 
um, orange and green, but still this one individual dark orange has just the same amount of chance as this one that's the light orange or this one that's a green. So it has equal chance. Well, when it's turned over in the bottle, it just came out that it's like just a couple green made it, no dark orange and a lot of light orange, okay? This is a change in the allele frequency in the population. Now, where do you actually see this? You actually see bottlenecks a lot. One of my favorites, and if you ever get to go up there, um, go up and see these guys. The Northern Elephant Seals in California is one of our California like rare um, animals that's so cool, but they were hunted to near extinction. And this is one of my favorite websites, by the way, which is UC Berkeley's Understanding Evolution. They will clear up tons of your misconceptions. But in the 1800s, these guys were hunted to near extinction. This website said there were 20 left at the end, but I'm pretty sure it got down to about eight. Um, or no, maybe it was 20. I think it was 20. And um, the last few, they were declared extinct when a group of people um, went down and saw like a population of like eight or nine left on an island, I think in Mexico. And they said, oh, look, there's like eight or nine. Then they bludgered them all to death so they could put them in a museum and they let one escape. That's horrible. Anyways, they think that there was about one little micro population somewhere and maybe this could be the 20 individuals that they're talking about here but there was um probably another micro population somewhere and then that population has has really taken off and their numbers have really rebounded so you might say oh well then they're fine and their numbers are fine what's not fine is that they all came from these 20 individuals. So there's really not very many, very much diversity. So in other words, if there's like a disease that goes through or some kind of um, physical catastrophe, these guys don't have much genetic variation to mean that one would survive and one wouldn't. So that becomes a problem. So um, just to recap, um, a bottleneck, all individuals have equal chance of surviving or dying. So um, some dominant individuals might die. Some recessive individuals might die. All, all individuals have an equal chance of being eliminated from the population. Another example of this, and I did not bring up a picture and I apologize, is like in the 1870s, there was like the slaughter of tens of millions of American bison. And it got down to where there was only about a thousand survivors. Like the new settlers just wiped them out. Well, because of that, that's a genetic bottleneck. There's just not very much genetic diversity there anymore. So the founder effect um, is the effect of a small group goes and somehow a small population winds up in a new place and ends up being like the parent population to a whole new one. Um, so a lot of times um, humans will move animals or plants around and that can cause the founder effect. Um, and sometimes it happens by nature. Um, one person that did this, um, in the 1800s, there was a person that like loved Shakespeare's writings and he wanted to be able to see every bird that was ever mentioned by Shakespeare in New York. So he bought, brought 50 males, 50 females of um, the starlings from Europe. And he let them go in New York. And now there's over 200 million of them across our continent. And they're just kind of a mess. And they've like gone into um, killing some of our native species, not directly, but using their resources so that our native ones cannot survive. So um, that's an example of a founder effect where there's maybe only a hundred to begin with, and they are the parents that they go and make this incredibly huge population over time. All right, so there's different evidences of evolution, and um, there's different things. There's like fossil records. One is of this horse. I'm going to bring up this picture right now. So we're, we'll take a look at the horse fossil record. At first, about 50, 55 million years ago, you had this dog-like horse that was small, lived in um, 
wetter, colder, forested areas. It had to be smaller in order to navigate around. And it slowly adapted or um, like evolved where as the climate kind of changed to this drier climate, those that were taller, faster, bigger, and could, you know, not get attacked and kill as easily and move fast, um, more horse-like, they were the ones that ended up surviving. Um, you also see evidence of evolution in um, anatomy and embryology, where you have these things like vestigial structures. Um, so this isn't vestigial structure, by the way. I want to show you some vestigial structures. Um, on humans, some vestigial structures are, sh they're basically, they don't have any apparent value, but they do exist. So um, on humans, the interesting things that we have are like a coccyx, which is our tailbone. Um, males have nipples, but that's actually um, part of um, like embryology. And I'll explain that later why um, when we talk about sexual reproduction. Um, but bo <coughs> excuse me, body hair, wisdom teeth. In our eyes, we have that tiny little like membrane. Um, we have ear muscles that pretty much don't do much. We suddenly have an eyebrow at the top, like a hairy little part, like above our eyes, which is kind of weird. Um, in some humans, they even have this palmaris longus muscle, and that's most people. Most people, if they do that, they have a muscle that sticks out. Mine is there. It's like so small. Um, it, you kind of have to bring your thumb and pinky together and then pull it towards you a little bit. Mine's really tiny, but, um, and some are absent completely. And that muscle, you know, is used for like climbing and things in some, you know, apes and we don't, we don't use it. Um, but those are all things that are some evidences of evolution. And we'll look at, um, another one, um, Land masses may have been connected differently over time, which can explain similar fossils found in areas um, that might have been connected. And it, it does seem like a pretty, pretty much like a puzzle piece, right? A lot of times even kids start to figure this out going, I think this was maybe, maybe connected somehow, you know, and it's thought that it was. And, um, so this was the super continent called Pangaea, and eventually um, it's thought that it broke up through continental drift to be where it is now. But what's great and interesting about the fossil record is that right where it's connected, you'll see that yes, it broke apart, but similar fossil records exist at the connection points going across. And so it's pretty cool to see that and see how that could have fit together. Additionally, there's um, molecular biology that shows common ancestor ancestry. One that I wanna show you for humans. Oh, I'm sorry, this website is cut off. Again, one of my favorite websites for evolution is Understanding Evolution from UC Berkeley, and I would totally recommend that as a great evolution source, but and I wish I, I just wish that I had done this a little bit better. Let me see if I can bring this. I think I'm making it worse. Anyways, the title of this article is Genealogy Enthusiasts Mind DNA for Clues to Evolutionary History. So um, one molecular marker that we have is that all females have DNA markers from one female, like a common female way back in our genetic record. And um, scientists call this like genetic Eve, or I've heard biological Eve. Um, and all females have her markers. So um, have that common marker. All males have markers from a common male um, that's called um, either genetic Adam or biological Adam, meaning he was the first like human um, of our species. So that is an interesting thing to go and look up. And, you know, if you're interested in that, you can go look up more. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to go into is speciation. Um, so speciation 
is animals uh, becoming different species, sometimes by being separated, sometimes by living in the same place and they become separated. Now, allopatric speciation, that's easy to understand. That means other homelands and it involves geographic separation. So like suddenly geologically a mountain range pops up and it like separates these two species. Over time though, the mountain gets worn away. The two species come back together, but they can no longer mate. They are now different species. Um, another example is say two birds are blown to an island um, during a storm. Some birds are blown there and some move into the rainforest and some stay on the beach. Well, over time, the ones in the rainforest are eating soft-bodied grubs and they, their song has to get louder to carry through the rainforest and they have to camouflage differently to get away from reptiles where the ones on the beach, they have to hunt, you know, hard-shelled animals and, and their song, you know, doesn't need to be as loud and they need to camouflage differently. Well, they're they're no longer after many generations maybe able to mate anymore because now they're different species. That's called allopatric speciation. Um, the hard one to understand is sympatric speciation. And that's one that, um, you know, here on this, on this webpage we looked at in the last um, chapter, um, it's where basically two organisms live in the same area and yet they could breed but for some reason they're not um so one classic example um is the north pacific northwest orcas so there's the resident orcas that stay there year round and um the resident orcas will eat fish and then there's the transient orcas and if you're looking at this going I can't tell these guys apart. I mean, this one has a solid area and this one has a wavy one. But other than that, if you're like, man, I can barely tell these guys apart. This one's got, you know, a little bit skinnier dorsal fin than that, but they're like almost the same. Um, the transient orcas, though they're the same species, they will not breed with them. They come and go. Transient means in and out. So, and they will eat mammals. So what caused these differences? Um, he, it's not really well known why that happened. They think that there was a bottleneck with them as well, but it definitely can happen. Um, sorry, I don't need that one yet. All right. So adaptive radiation means that there were many species from one species. So that means they, they moved in, they all found their different niche and lifestyles, and that led to multiple species over time. That's called adaptive radiation. You can have two, you can have sexual selection where um, animals accept or reject a mate based on um, appearance or their, the sounds that they make or the food they're able to provide. So sometimes you have um, speciation again, without geographic separation. So they're not actually separated. So one type of this that I want to talk about is called um, prezygotic mechanisms for reproductive isolation. And that's like sometimes two individuals that seem compatible will have a barrier that stops the sperm from ever getting to the egg at all. So, so the two of them just it's called a prezygotic barrier what where it just stops them so i wanted to show you one of my favorite birds um called um the, here's some different things temporal isolation this can be a barrier like one's asleep during the day one's asleep or asleep at night um, but one can be based on behavior and when i was down in the sea of cortez studying whale sharks there's islands of blue-footed boobies there. And this is a bird called the blue-footed booby. And you've got to look them up and look up more information. So this is a male here dancing. The males have very big feet and they're blue. And they do these interesting dances where they lift up their feet and they're like, look at my feet, look at my feet. Like I can do this dance. And then the females will watch this dance and either be like, yeah, okay, I'll mate with you. Or like, no way, bud, go, you know, kick rocks. I'm not, you know, mating with you. And so this is like 
um, a behavioral type of thing, but it causes the sperm and egg never having a chance to even eat. So, um, and then I wanted to mention again that temporal isolation means that these two are just awake and asleep at different types times of the day. So, for instance, there could be crickets that live in the same backyard, but some are awake during the day and some are awake during the night. Well, they're never going to mate because they're not awake at the same time. So that would be a, um, a temporal isolation.